great to see so many people here, really lovely, so many familiar faces, and it's great to welcome Charlie back. Uh, Charlie, of course, uh, staged the first show in the gallery 18 months ago, and it's great to have him back. So it's as if a master of the abstract meets a master of the narrative. <coughs> Away you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Robert. Um, okay, away we go. Um, yeah, it's really nice to be asked to do this um, because, quite simply, I'm a fan. I've known Neil's work for a long time, and I've always been drawn to it. Yeah, and uh, true enough, I come from a very different department of art making, but um, there's so much in here that I identify with and recognise. Um, anyway, we go back to about 19, in, the ni in, the, in the 1990s, I did a series of prints in the graphic studio. I'm not a printer, I'm just a painter, your honour, a humble painter, but I, I was invited up to do some prints in the graphic studio in Dublin, and he was a member there, isn't that right? Yeah. Uh, and the graphic studio is an extraordinary place down on the docks, where it's all shiny, shiny, shiny new now. This was completely derelict. Well, just... Um, abandoned Dockland and the graphic studio had built this wonderful studio in a warehouse and it was just lovely to go in there and I've been in and out of studios since and they're just wonderful places, print studios are great places, it's, uh, it's I, I don't know, I think it's sometimes it's like walking into the, into history, into the past, they're, they're very timeless and they're about a timeless art form I think um, and there's always just a wonderful atmosphere, a wonderful camaraderie, sharing of technical expertise, um, and uh, just a great place to work. And I was I had the, the privilege of being led through a whole series of prints there. But it was a wonderful, wonderful place to work. Um, lovely atmosphere, great conversations, great gossip, um, which I missed being up the side of a mountain. So it was always nice to get get stuck in there. Anyway, Neil was all part of that, but uh, 20 years ago, he left it all. He'd had enough gossip, he'd given enough gossip, and he went solo, more or less. <laughs> Anyhow, um, um, print, I'm going to do something which is, might be a little bit ridiculous, but I, I'm a f I, I, I often think there's confusion about, etch we're dealing with etching, let's just talk about etching, there's so many print forms. But, um, <laughs> People don't often understand exactly what it takes to make an etching. So I'm going to give a ladybird version of how to make a line, <laughs> a, a, an etching, just in case anybody doesn't know. And it might help in appreciation of the, of the print work here. So if I wanted to do a print, a simple, say, a simple line, line drawing, just a circle, um, I'm given a plate, a um, copper plate, and um, that copper plate then is uh, heated and a, a wax layer is put onto, onto, onto it. It's lovely, just rubbed on and then rolled on and you get this beautiful thin layer of wax on your plate. And um, then that's allowed to cool off. Um, and then I come along with my drawing instrument. What do we call it, Neil? A needle, I suppose, or a stylus. Or a nail. <laughs> it's just a sharp implement. And so I do my drawing. So simple cir circle. Uh, now what I'm doing is I'm not drawing, I'm not scratching into the plate at all. All I'm doing is pulling off that wax. Um, and that is the basis of what so much of what's going on in, in, in etching. The wax is the wax is removed, my line, my line is inscribed there in the wax. Then then it's ready, basically ready for acid. As I say, this is the ladybird version, so it does, uh, there are more subtle processes that might fit in. The back of the plate is blocked out with bitumen, and so it's completely sealed except for my drawn line, and then it is put into acid, and in the acid, the acid just eats what is exposed, so it's my line, and that's the etched line. Um, then it's all cleaned off, and then it is ready for printing. Quick fast forward, so it's ready to print. Ink is wiped on, worked onto the plate, and then worked off and off and off, and then polished off with lid free cloths. So you end up back with a perfect shiny copper plate, and my circle has got ink in the 
pose. Is this making sense? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I know it's probably uh, teaching my granny how to suck eggs <laughs> for an awful lot of you, but it's, I think it might be worth doing. Um, and then I was ready to go into the press, and the press is a big flatbed press, a huge steel roller. It's placed on the flatbed, then paper, which is prepared, is dampened, nice thick uh, etching paper is put over. A blanket, a kind of a felt blanket is put over that, which softens the blow between the between things and pushes the paper into the plate. And then it's basically hand rolled through, it comes out the far end, peel it off, and there is the ink. There is my etching. That's it. Simple as that. That's the, that's, that's the basis of a line etching. Am I right? You made it here for me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I just thought it, I just thought it was sort of worth, worth, worth saying that in case there's any confusion. But I think there's often confusion about print and the whole print medium. And you know, like there's even the term, you know, is that original or is it a print? So that's a sort of that's a sort of um, that's where the term print is used in different contexts, you know. But this is fine art printing, and it's ancient fine art printing, etching, lithography, silk screen. They're the kind of the core, the core ones. So let's go over. Um, and what we're, <laughs> what we're dealing with here, with Neil's thing, it's been a real surprise to me coming in. I've, I have to admit, I've not seen the work in the, in the flesh. So I have all the images on screen, and of course they're all the same size. So the first thing is the shock of the very large prints. Um, and it's the, whole, the whole thing, is, it's, been a, it's been, it has jumped off, they're jumping off the walls more than they were jumping out off the screen, and they were jumping off the screen, I can assure you. I think this is really wonderful work. Um, so I think what, just to, what we're dealing with here is the core is the etching. Um, and, oh yes, I should say, that was what I described there was line. There are so many other techniques that are applied to etching to create all the tones and the whole lot. But, uh, but it's pertinent to talk about the line because Neil is the master of the line which permeates all the work. I think he is the, he is the, the line man. Um, but we're dealing with, so we're dealing with a, a couple of things here, the, the prints, and then we're, we're dealing with a few monos, which are wonderful things where basically a, draw, a, a drawing, it's just a one-off drawing, then there's a certain colouring applied to it and is run through a print to, to, the, to the press, but it is ultimately just making um, one, uh, a mono piece. And then there are the, these wonderful, uh, digitally generated drawings, the big, big things. Now that's completely beyond my pay scale to understand and know anything about them. The, con the contract I signed with Robert and Lucy didn't, didn't say I didn't know anything about that. About that. But they're, they were real. They were a real surprise for me, and they're just gorgeous things, absolutely wonderful things. Um, to just to go into the work a little bit. And I'll try and be not too too long-winded and, and um, waffly. Um, but uh, one could come in here and say it's an exhibition of um, landscape, seascape, and you could. Um, but I think that would be kind of doing an injustice. I think it's an awful lot more than that. Um, okay, it is all based on landscape and, land and the sea and the sky. But there's an attitude, there's an underlying attitude that... that that, that is running through it, that is at the base of everything here. And I've, I've regarded Neil as, a, as I said, what I've really admired about his work has been this graphic sensibility, the line and how the line is used. And you know the whole crosshatch thing, it's not as hugely in evidence in this work as a lot that I've seen over the years. But it is, it kind of describes, it, it sort of points to an underlying attitude of it's sort of an honesty that this is this is artifice, this is contrivance, this is not I am not making a window into reality. I'm not present, representing reality to you. I am up front here, I'm scratching away or a plate on a pa paper. And it's sort of it's it's a play between the landscape and the artist in a very, very real sort of way. This work is looking at the landscape and it's looking at it and saying, you're quite interesting, um, would you like to play? Could we discuss things? Could we have a conversation? Um, or rather, that there's no duffing the cap or the hat 
to the landscape here. There's no big reverential thing going on. In fact, there's a certain amount of, I'd say, irreverence. There's a bit of cheekiness going on, um, which I love. You know, we're constantly being brought back to, somehow, back to ourselves, back to the artist, and not being kind of sucked into some glorious landscape experience. It can be found in it. It is there. It's, it's massively there. Um, but I think there's something else at play that is... Uh, I think it's probably... I, I've had a certain amount of talking with Neil about this, and we're kind of, we've been on the same page. In terms of the whole making of art and what it takes to make, to make a bit of art. And, you know, I think the artist making something comes to it with really strong ideas, strong notions, strong feelings, concepts, a lot of stuff. We usually carry a lot of stuff into it. And that's very important. Um, and we're very conscious beings, artists, and a lot goes into it. But um, there's a certain point where you you go into, this is all underpinning all your thinking, but there's a certain point where something happens. And what happens is there's another player in that arena, and the, that other player is the thing that you're making. And um, so the dynamic changes. The whole, the whole, everything changes. In fact, because there's, there's something, there's, there's something there that you have to deal with. It's not, it's no longer in your head, in your heart. Um, it's, it's happening there. And I think that's, I think, with that in mind, if you, you, I think that sort of thinking is very much at play here. You get to a certain point in making a piece of art that all that underpinning thinking. It doesn't disappear, but it somehow or other can get over, covered over with layers of new thoughts and thinking and that, that just literally appears in the whole making process. And you end up someplace, someplace else. So, I'll just hang on a second here. In a way, like I didn't want to ask Neil, what, what are these all about? Because they're about an awful lot of things that are in his head and in his heart, but they're also about an awful lot of things that have happened. And I would like to think that there's a lot, there's a, a huge amount happening here that he knows nothing about, and that that is really <coughs> the, 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 that's what art making is about. You want to make something. I always want to make something that surprises me, that shocks me. That, um, in other words, I when I'm making something. I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this, and there's a certain point where it, sh it just shoots up and takes on, it, it, it bypasses, it goes, it goes beyond me and things, things start happening. And an awful lot of my thinking and underpinning so it's kind of become a little bit, um, I won't say obsolete, but kind of maybe a bit um, um, unnecessary in, the, in the, any discussion about the work. So um, that, is, that in many ways is... Uh, my attitude to this work. I, there's, if you study it, there's so much going on. There's all sorts of ridiculous and mad things happening. It's fairly, it's fairly wild. Um, there's one piece out there which um, I think um, says an awful lot about Neil's attitude and what we're dealing with here, and the artist and the work, and where the artist is in the work. And, this, and actually, there's, there's a whole figurative thing that we just we should mention. But there's a piece out there called the Donegal Punt, right? Yeah. That's the one. Um, mad. It's um, red and blue, red, red, red rocks, and of course the boat, red, same, same red. And it's all, so it's all quite radical and not. Uh, I just love it. It's just kind of a, just this symphony of reds and blues. And then there's this, these lovely lines in the sea. And if any of you know the sea, I, I over, I, I live overlooking the sea down on Barra. And um, after after a lot of storm, after a stormy sea out out far. You often end up with calm in the shore, and then you get all these lovely white uh, foam lines. They're very elegant. Um, um, that are the, the residue of a fairly stormy sea. In fact, I, I remember an old neighbour of mine telling me that in the old days, those lines were red, literally red, as uh, um, in terms of forecasting and so on. But anyway, um, Neil speaks in there has these, <laughs> and then, then on closer inspection. It's actually a drafting tool. There's a thing called. I did. I did. And it's kind of. This is. I think this is sort of that piece sort of 
if you kind of consider that, I think you get you get into the brain here that is behind so much of this. But it's a, it's called a French curve. It's a it's a drawing implement. It's I'd say it's very ancient. I I never had one, but I actually must get one. But it's a drafter drawer, say like an architect, a graphic designer, or any sort of drafts person would have them to hand to create any sort of curve they want. Anyway, there's a there's, <laughs> in the middle of the sea. There's one of these, and somehow or other, it is. I think it's Neil saying, you know, this is me. I'm a drafter. I'm a drawer. You know, this is this is this is not a scene to. Don't get sucked in here. Come back here. And the same with an awful lot of there's an awful lot of stuff floating around, like these here, the dots, um, dots floating over the thing. <laughs> I I just love that because it sort of says here, and come back here, don't be going back in there, don't be heading off into those storms and getting all romantic. Come back up here. This is a this is a two dimensional um, event that we're dealing with, you know. And then there's all sorts of great things happening, like. If you, <laughs> If you this one, there's a few of them. Cut them in half, and the whole bottom half. There's a oh, oh there's one. Oh yeah, there's one act there. Where's the one? Like, um, there's one. This uh, It's uh, the gallant, the gallant, and the and the, and the tanker. Yeah. Uh, what's it called? The, 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 the what do you call the tanker? Is um, I can't remember. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I think bulk carrier. Bulk carrier. Yeah. yeah. Gallant and bulk carrier. It's just brilliant. It's just, it's nearly as good as, um, in terms of titles, as uh, Toyota and, and I was about, um, yeah, the Toyota and the Plough. Anyway, the, the Gallatin Boat Carrier is a brilliant piece as far as you cut off, cut it in half, and the whole bottom half is just this extraordinary album of lines and tones and just sort of, I won't say chaos, but it's just free form, you know, free form improvising. It's very jazzy. Um, uh, put it back into the context of the image, and of course, what it is. What it is riffing off is the foreshore, and um, it puts it back into some sort of a context. But you're constantly, in this work, you're constantly being played with, I think. And the figure also plays with you. There's a figure floating around here, which is kind of new, is it? Uh, it's something that's it's a, uh, common. There's, but there's a lot of them. Um, yeah. And I really like them because they're sort of, they're not, these aren't, it's not a figure in a landscape just like that. It's sort of bringing you in and it's kind of, it could be you. It's certainly him. There's an artist in there, so it's all on his knees. And it's about looking and observing. Um, Kasper, yeah. Kasper David, David Friedrich, yeah. Friedrich, the German painter. Um, he did a lot of these very, very dramatic theatrical landscapes with figures in them. And they were doing something a bit like that. Um, and there's, there's one iconic image of the figure just taking up a good part of the picture, looking into the landscape, and it sort of invites you in to look and be, be a looker with him. So there's a whole there's a whole looking thing going on here as well, which I which I find really interesting. Um, I think that's I think I've rambled enough on 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 on, on this. Um, just let me look in here. Um, do you, I would just say one thing that I, I that I'm, you know, I really admire this work, and I trust this work, and I trust is something that is absolutely necessary in in art. Um, and you have to trust the artist, trust because there's nothing worse than being brought into something that's untrustworthy, and you're left in a confused state. I think this stuff brings you into it brings you into a confused state, all right, but in a really good way. You know, so I trust it in that in that way. Um, and I would just say, um, art. Yeah. Art should reveal a lot. Art should alert you. Art should heighten your perceptions, bring you to new places, new understandings. Art can refresh your thinking. The work here of you can do this. We're invited to think a bit differently, to see a bit differently, maybe to enjoy the world more, and by extension, to enjoy and embrace our life more. Okay.